Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. You're obsessed with her, and you're obsessed with her daughter! All right, easy, Geraldo. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking the something of the something. We're talking calling men chum. And we're talking it, as in homosexual. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and if I were you, Joe, I'd stay away from the pate. The calories. Oh my god. <laughs> that line, so rude. Uh, everyone, we are discussing Alfred Hitchcock's rope today, and mm-hmm. rope-a-dope, as Joe calls it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, a.k.a. Alfred Hitchcock's gayest movie ever, and that's really saying uh, something. I mean, it's the one that really puts it front and center, but doing some research, it's pretty evident that Hitchcock was interested in the queer experience when you look at the number of queer actors and queer characters he includes in his films. But yeah, this one, very queer indeed. I wonder if it's, you know, it's like, you know, you you're, you want what you can't have. You're you're fascinated by what you aren't. So maybe it's because Hitchcock was not queer. Uh, he was just fascinated with queer life. So there's a lot of bitchery in this movie. I would say, yeah. I mean, if you remove the murder from this movie, it's basically a bit of a screwball comedy about like a couple of gays who just want to hook up their fag hat. Sorry, fruit fly. <laughs> with the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, right? Because that entire subplot with Janet and, uh, is it Kenneth? Kenneth. Kenneth. Uh, you're just like, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Why do you care so much, Brandon? Oh, it's because you're a queen who likes to stir up shit. Yeah, I mean, this is a first time watch for both of us, right, Joe? No, I've seen this before. Oh, have you really? Yeah. Oh, shit. I didn't, oh, fuck, I didn't know that. Well, this is a first time <laughs> watch for me. <laughs> I mean, it's not like I've seen it a million times or anything, but I think I walked, I went through a Hitchcock phase when I was in university, Mm. and I just tried to watch a bunch of the quote-unquote classics, and this was one of the ones where people said, oh, it's formally, like stylistically, it's such a departure from any other film that he made, but also any other film that was being made at the time. So I was like, cool, I want to see what this, you know, no edits, long takes film looks like. Oh, I was really into I mean, I knew that going in, you know, oh, it, it's it's meant to look almost like one simultaneous shot for the most part. There's like there's like mm-hmm. three or four actual like un, un, unhidden cuts in this yes. movie. But it's still I mean, watching even like uh, on the Wikipedia page for this movie, you can see a chart that actually lists every single cut, all the shots, how long they are. And I was like, oh, I'm going to like follow along with this. And mm-hmm. I kept missing them because they yeah. were so well hidden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of them are a little more obvious. Some of them are, you know, very they're traditional in the way that he's editing the film. But yeah, yeah. I think at the end of the day, there's something like 12 in the whole film. It's 80 minutes. Uh, Yes, correct. It's 10. Or sorry, there's 10 shots in the movie. Nine cuts, I guess, if you want to say. Yeah. Okay. Um... Yeah, well, I mean, we have a lot to discuss because not only does this pull from a real life murder, it's also based Mm -hmm. on a play. And of course, we have this incredible camera gimmick that we have to talk through. Indeed. Yeah, it's multifaceted, this rope-a-dope. So, okay, why don't we start at the beginning? In the beginning. Oh my Uh, god. (laughs) (laughs) First, there was man, and then there was rope. So, this film and play are based on the real life case slash situation of Mm -hmm. Leopold and Lowe. That is Nathaniel Freudenthal Leopold Jr. and Richard Albert Lowe, who they're usually, again, referred to collectively as Leopold and Lowe. Uh, They were two wealthy students and possibly lovers. I, I kept finding things that were like, oh yeah, they were, but like it wasn't really well, it wasn't known for sure. It was just assumed they were. Do you have any more information on that? Yeah, it's very weird because they have always been referred to as queer, but then when you start looking through it, you're like, okay, but where is the proof? Like, right? where is it coming out? Even if you comb through the entire Wikipedia page, you still don't really see it. I think it comes out in 
Leopold's letters and or his autobiography. Oh, so maybe people were inferring from from things in his letter that probably didn't say, I really enjoyed fucking you. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was probably just like, oh, this seems like they were lovers. They were, they were, we were, we were getting a reading out of their letters. Yeah, and yet people feel strongly enough that they can be like, oh, this one was the top and this one was the bottom. I'm like, uh, excuse you? But that's the thing, right? So we, we can talk about that a lot, too, because even in this film, yeah, I saw a reference to uh, to Brandon as the top and Philip as the bottom mm-hmm. because Brandon is, you know, the, the masculine yeah. and, the, and the, the, the dominant one and Philip is less so. And mm-hmm. it's like, that's not really the stigma we want to put out there, everybody. <laughs> Well, ideally, we don't want any stigma, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's not stereotype people based their their sexual position preference is probably not determined strictly by their effeminacy or their, I don't know, like bossiness. Yes, yeah, 100%. And if you uh, subscribe to that stigma, um, stop listening. <laughs> well, just, you know, do some work on yourself. <laughs> anyway, so these are two wealthy students that were at the University of Chicago who, in May of 1924, kidnapped and murdered a 14-year-old boy named Bobby mm-hmm. Frankie. Franks. I'm sorry, Bobby Franks. Which I'm assuming for many reasons, specifically the the, the, the the production code, the Hayes code, they could not kill a child in this movie. No, and, and that's often not the thing that people kind of gravitate to. They're mostly interested in the killers. Like a lot of true crime, they don't really seem to give two shits about the actual victim. Right, I mean, right? Well, what do we know about Mr. David Kentley in this movie outside of the fact that he is soon to be engaged to Miss Janet? Mm-hmm. Actually, if you watch the trailer, they're, they're already engaged. He had proposed to her that day in the park, and then he... He leaves to come for this meeting and they kill him. <laughs> so no, I thought I, I thought that they said that, but then she said something that was like, oh, we're, we're, we might as well be engaged. So I was like, well, mm-hmm. that's a weird way to put that. But It's because she doesn't formally accept. Oh, okay. Well, that needed to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they committed the murder um, characterized at the time as the crime of the century as a demonstration of their ostensible intellectual superiority, which they believed enabled and entitled them to carry out a quote unquote perfect crime without okay. consequences. And that's definitely a thing where I'm like, okay, cool. Like do that. Um, <laughs> don't, don't throw do a dinner that. party. <laughs> <laughs> on top of the body. <laughs> well, admittedly, in real life, they did not yes, throw exactly. a dinner party. <laughs> they just got caught. Um, yes. No, so, so Leopold is Brandon. Uh, he believed himself akin to the Nietzschean Superman and Loeb as the... Oh, I'm sorry. Nope. They, they swap back and forth. This is the biggest problem. Yeah. Okay, so Leopold believed himself akin to the Nietzschean Superman and Loeb as the dominant figure or quote-unquote top, as you said, mm. in their relationship. It was believed... That Loeb used sex as a way of repaying Leopold for going along with the whole thing. Okay, so so Loeb is our Brandon stand-in, and Leopold is Philip. Right. Anyway, so using sex to coerce him into following through. Uh, Leopold would later write that his mo- that his motive was, uh, to the extent that I had one, was to please Dick. Which, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, after they were arrested, because they were caught. <laughs> oh, yeah, immediately. That's my favorite part. But also, just as a sidebar, did you read what they did to this boy? No, I did not. So they poured acid on his face and also his penis <gasps> to okay. try to disguise his identity. So, okay, but we're, so, so we're sexualizing the crime now, like, by, mm. by rem- oh, my God. <laughs> I know. Problematic already. Like, <laughs> we have two seemingly queer men who are... I guess disfiguring is the best way of putting it, uh, yes. a, a man's face and genitals, which, mm-hmm. oof. Mm. Yeah. Well, they deserved everything they got. Loeb's defense attorney, uh, it was kind of a famous thing, though. He basically uh, criticized capital punishment as retributive rather than transformative justice. So instead of getting a death penalty, both men were sentenced to life imprisonment plus 99 years, just yeah. in case. <laughs> <laughs> I always love those. Loeb uh, was murdered by a fellow prisoner in 1936, whereas Leopold was released on parole in 1958. Yeah, there's some weird circumstances with Loeb's death as well, where he was maybe killed by another queer inmate, and or the person claimed that he was the victim of unwanted sexual advances and therefore had to defend himself. So that's the argument the prison went with. So they basically queer shamed a dead man. Which, I mean, in 36, I mean, that's... 
Yeah. Again, not right, but it's I, I get it. <laughs> I, 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 it's the time period, right? Like, just kill the gays. Well, and and this is, again, very firmly the situation and the time period that we find ourselves in. So, folks, just to put this into some historical context, if you need to remember where we're at in U.S. history, I'm going to recommend that you go back and listen to the historical chat that we had on our Creature from the Black Lagoon episode. Because mm. basically, the fears of masculinity under attack by covert homosexuals who are lurking everywhere and they're super dangerous that's still the same time period that we're in uh as we talk about this real life case but also leading up to rope the next decade yes because i mean yeah rope comes out in 48 so it's about you know what 24 years after the actual murders but obviously these this crime has been the inspiration for a lot of films namely rope but it's also um uh uh, the movie Compulsion from 1959 mm-hmm. and the 2002 film Murder by Numbers with yeah. uh, Michael Pitt and Ryan Gosling. But I would also argue, and I think maybe you've keyed me into this or clued me into this show, but Scream. Yeah, I think I said it way back in our very first episode because yeah. I see Stu as the boy who is coerced into going along mm-hmm. with it by his more dominant boyfriend. And I think probably when you said that to me, you know, what, two and a half years ago, I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Because uh-huh. I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Because when we were talking about this episode last week, you were like, I don't know what Leopold and Loeb is. <laughs> I mean, you've said it multiple times, and I was like, it's probably, like, two men. I got it right. <laughs> You're like, is that an indie rock band? <laughs> is that a band? That, actually, <laughs> that probably was my question. <laughs> okay, so moving into Rope. So this movie is based on a stage play. Um, mm-hmm. The play is set on the first floor of a house in Mayfair, London, in 1929. Um, it's loosely based on the Leopold and Loeb murder case. Um, so we have, you know, two university students, uh, Wyndham Brandon and Charles Grano. Um, who have murdered their fellow student, Ronald Kentley. So again, all these names are changed in the film. Yeah. As an expression of their supposed intellectual superiority. At the beginning of the play, they hide the body in a chest, blah, blah, blah. The same thing happens. The difference is, though, that the play is a bit more explicitly queer than the film (laughs) is. Just a touch, yeah. Yes. So um, in in the film, you know, Hitchcock and the adapter Hume Cronin and the screenwriter author Lawrence, because if y'all go back to our episode in Rebecca, you'll know that someone is paid to adapt the thing and then someone is paid to write the screenplay. I I guess maybe the adapter is like, okay, we're going to do this, this and this. Here's a basic outline of what we're doing with the Mm -hmm. original property. I think so, yeah. And then the next person, aka the screenwriter, comes in to finesse the dialogue and the characterization. That's that how would I've make sense. It. So obviously, the film moves it all to 1940s New York City. Pretty much every character is renamed except for uh, James Stewart's Rupert Cadell. And then they added in a bunch of uh, like characters and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> C- characters and stuff. There- there's my academic uh, <laughs> explanation of this. <laughs> this film, it's populated with. Characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, Rope is one of Hitchcock's most experimental and uh, one of the most interesting experiments ever attempted by a major director working with big box office names. So, again, if you've seen the film, you know this, but if you haven't seen it, um, Hitchcock abandons many standard film techniques to allow for the long, unbroken scene. So, uh, mm-hmm. what, what, what are modern films that have done this? You know, you have the movie, uh, like, Silent House with Elizabeth Olsen, Birdman. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I was like, really? We're going with that no-budget, <laughs> schlocky horror? horror film that no one has seen with Elizabeth Olsen? Okay. I, 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 so I, I have seen Silent House because it was the winner of that dreaded F Cinema score and it's oh, not right. a bad movie. It's also a remake, I think, of a Spanish film. I think so, yeah. I will admit I was going with a more highfalutin option. I was going to say Russian Ark. I don't know what that means. Okay. It's a it's a film, a Russian <laughs> film that's set entirely in a museum, but it is one single take. Isn't 1917 the same way? Uh, Yes, actually. You are correct. I mean, again, it's more common today, but back yeah. in 1948, it was not common. And no, it would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Because we can only shoot in 10 minute reels. Yes. Okay, perfect. So yes, they could each shot ran continuously for up to 10 minutes, which is the camera's film capacity uh, without interruption. It was shot on a single set, obviously in this apartment, mm-hmm. aside from the opening establishing shot uh, street scene under the credits. But outside of that, there's very little editing in the film. The walls of the set were on rollers and could silently be moved out of the way to make way for the camera and then replaced when they were to come back into shot. Prop men were constantly moving furniture and other props out of the way of the large Technicolor camera. 
And then, oh, this is also, I think, Hitchcock's first Technicolor film as well. He'd done all black and white before this. It was. And folks, if you have never seen what the early Technicolor cameras look like, they are the size of about a fridge or a washing machine. So imagine (laughs) that coming at you as prop people are pulling things away from you and you're trying not to trip on cables. So, I, I mean, obviously, I've heard the term Technicolor so many times. It's like, you know how they colored films back then Mm -hmm. but i was like but how did they do it so i went to like the the wikipedia page for technicolor and i was like oh this is too much i don't know (laughs) it's very technical (laughs) it's very technical i was like okay i might just watch a documentary on it to be honest oh listeners if you have a good recommendation or maybe a brief youtube video please send it our way Ooh, I mean, I can Google that. But yes, yeah, so by, by, if there's an actual documentary on it, by all means, like send it to me. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so a team of sound men and camera operators kept the camera and microphones in constant motion uh, mm-hmm. as the actors kept to a carefully choreographed set of cues, which, I mean, it makes sense, right? This is based on a play. It feels like it's like you're shooting a play. Yes. It shouldn't. I was going to say it shouldn't be that difficult because, you know, we have like filmed things of, of, uh, of plays and musicals all the time. But those are also fixed cameras, whereas that is not what Hitchcock was interested in doing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can really see it when you watch this movie. I'm hyper aware of how frequently the camera is on the prowl. Yes, yes, absolutely. So this filming technique, which of course conveys the impression of continuous action, you know, this film is mostly in real time. It's an 80 minute movie and it takes place over a 100 minute period. So there's like Mm -hmm. 20 minutes of stuff that's sped up here. Yep. But it serves to lengthen the duration of the action in the mind of the viewer. Not much really behind the scenes drama here, although James Stewart did not enjoy this film. <laughs> well, no, I think he rightfully realized that he was miscast in this role. And I, I have impressions on that informed by the screenwriter, who we should note is a very loud and proud homosexual man. And if you want a delightful a very candid, very spill the tea documentary. I highly encourage you to watch the one that accompanies the DVD or the Blu-ray of this. Ooh, good to know. Well, and also, it's not just him who was gay on the set of this film. Well, no. <laughs> John Dahl, who plays Brandon, is believed to have been gay. Co-star mm-hmm. Farley Granger, who plays Philip, was it was gay. Obviously, the screenwriter Arthur Lawrence was gay. They were fucking. Yeah, well, and because they wanted Montgomery Cliff to play uh, Brandon. Mm -hmm. And they wanted Cary Grant to play Rupert. Which, uh, uh, Cary Grant I could have seen. Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a movie with James Stewart, ever. And as soon as I heard his voice in this movie, I was like, oh, that guy. (laughs) Mari! Sorry, most people know him from It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, which I've never seen. Uh, okay. Or the Philadelphia story. I, I looked at it up. I was like, surely I've seen something with this man. Because I've never seen Rear Window. I've never seen North by Northwest. I, never I seen Harvey. Okay. I, I didn't go through a Hitchcock phase whenever uh, I was in university. Oh, there you go. Hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Stewart did not like this. He thought uh, he thought that the important thing here was the camera, not the actors, which really are Tim. And right. I don't. Even disagree with him, and critics agree with him too, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, this is a movie where it is it is a gimmick, mm-hmm. and it's more about that. And I kind of felt that for a lot of the movie, where I was paying more attention to the camera than I was what was actually happening on screen. If that makes any sense, it does. And it's a little disappointing, if only because and. I mean, I'm not going to say turn around and watch this movie again, but the dialogue I find in this movie actually sparkles. There's a lot of wit and a lot of cleverness in here. And again, Lawrence is kind of a gem for acknowledging all the ways that Hitchcock sort of fuck this up by (laughs) not just undercutting him in certain ways, like the original murder, like the murder that opens this movie was not in the script. Hitchcock added that, which then removes a ton of tension because you Originally, you were not meant to know whether or not there was a body in the chest. Oh, but okay. Well, so when we get to some queer reading shit, I actually think that the murder is very necessary to help support oh, a queer reading. A hundred percent, yes. Uh, <laughs> but the other big thing is that in the adaptation process, one of the big changes that shifts, and I apologize if I'm stepping on your toes. No, so go ahead. One of the big things that shifts from the play to the film is that Rupert, the Jimmy Stewart character, is mm-hmm. actually meant to be queer. Well, because he's supposed to be an ex-lover of, I want to say, Brandon, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which, again, so if, if, I don't know why I'm talking to people who uh, would would combat us on a career reading of this film, but if you're a bloody disgusting commenter who always shits on us, (laughs) there's really no defense for you here. (laughs) Like, this movie's gay as fuck. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
this is not a creature from the Black Lagoon. This is very firmly a Bride of Frankenstein situation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then uh, j- just quickly finishing up the production here, you know, uh, the, 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 the cyclorama in the background, which is, of course, like the backdrop of the, uh, uh, the New York cityscape, it was the largest backing ever used on a soundstage. Uh, it included yeah. models of the Empire State and Chrysler buildings, numerous chimneys smoke, lights coming on in buildings, neon lights light up, and the sunset slowly unfolds as the movie progresses. Um, within the course of the film, the clouds made up of spun glass change position and shape eight times i'll confess that's one of the things i always forget to pay attention to because i know it's happening but i find that i'm not it, it's so subtly done that i mm. almost don't even take notice of it even though you can very clearly see that it is getting darker as the film progresses yes 100 percent. and and i don't want to say that i didn't like this movie i actually did like this movie a lot i just didn't love it but i i will sub. I will agree with you that I would love to actually watch this again to pay attention more to the dialogue than just mm-hmm. the camera work. Because on a first time viewing, it's very much like, oh, shit, like this is 1948. Look at this shit. Oh, yeah. It's a technical marvel, but it also means that you're often not really paying attention to the narrative. Well, and that's the thing. Is it on me or is it on the film? I, I, who could say? Uh, it's tricky, right? Because we're talking about a film from 1948. This is not a novelty to us anymore. And yet I find when I watch the film, it does feel like a novelty. It feels fresh and new in that way. So I do kind of think the film is saying, hey, aren't I amazing technically? So it is hard to overlook that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, so yeah, Rope was released theatrically on August 26th, 1948 in New York City, and then nationwide a month later on September 25th, 1948. It did perform poorly at the box office, uh, and of course our good queer screenwriter, Arthur Lawrence, attributed this failure to audiences' uneasiness with the homosexual undertones and the relationship between Philip and Brandon. And lest you think, again, that this is just like, oh, it's just, uh, it's just subtext. Yeah, it's just TSA. The movie was banned in several American cities because of the implied homosexuality between Philip and Brandon. Mm-hmm. Again, folks, let's not forget, we're very worried about masculinity being under fire from the so-called homosexual agenda. So it makes sense that people would look at this movie. It's not really subtext. It's pretty textual. And look at it be like, oh, yeah, no, we're not supporting this queer film. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So there is a person who has, like, a, honestly, the, the most quote unquote well known or famous reading, a queer reading of this film. And it's someone named D.A. Miller in a 1990 essay called Anal Rope. And it's a long one. <laughs> and there's some things in it that I think both you and I don't agree on, Joe. But one thing that he did try to do in this uh, in this essay, he was tr- trying to set right film criticism's refusal to acknowledge the homosexuality in Rip's protagonist. So mm. one of the arguments Miller put forth is that the celebrated technique that had been film critics' exclusive and obsessive focus on the implied homosexuality was informed by and inseparable from the threat posed by gay meth- male sexuality. So it's like... I don't know, like, like critics didn't want to acknowledge it because they were afraid of it. And so, yeah, and that's actually why I made the joke off the top. So one of my three things was it. And yeah, it's because nobody wanted to talk about it, as in homosexuality. Apparently, even on set, they didn't talk about it. So no one acknowledged the fact that they were making this a homosexual queer horror film. Which is interesting, though, because I'm just like, okay, but John Dahl and Farley Granger on there as your leads, both gay men. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to insinuate that they were fucking behind the scenes, but, um, you know, they're both very attractive men. And, you know. I just told you, Farley Granger was fucking the screenwriter. Oh, the screenwriter. Well, I mean, no, I, I'm not. He can't do both? No, not in those <laughs> times. <laughs> Anyway, so according to Warner Brothers um, records, the film earned about $2 million domestically and $720,000 overseas. Currently, and again, like we talked about this with old movies all the time, like mm-hmm. it doesn't, Rotten Tomatoes scores don't really matter, but <laughs> they're not very helpful. <laughs> no, they're not because they're all modern. It's like, oh, it's 1948, five stars. Um, <laughs> Rope holds a score of 94% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 47 reviews with an average score of 7.78 out of 10. And we've got a letterbox score of eight out of 10. But in terms of response at the time, you know, people were like, oh, it's exceptionally fine, like ingenious technique, um, more of a technical tour de force than a moving film. But for like flat out negative reviews, I mean, we have people that are like, um, it's interesting for people who understand filmmaking, but for anyone else, it's pretty dull. The story can't sustain the scant 80 minute runtime. Someone, oh, 
pearls clutching, the opening scene is too graphic, and the film as a whole <laughs> is too gruesome. So be warned before you walk into the theater. <laughs> that definitely reads like a period review. Yes. Suspense is lost because of the constant movement of the camera. Um, having regular edits would have been better. <laughs> I'm sorry, how is suspense lost from a moving camera? That doesn't even make sense. To me, it keeps me on edge most of the time, because I'm like, cool, where are we going? What's happening behind me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh. And then the the other critique was people really didn't like the dialogue in this film. Um, people <sighs> thought the bad dialogue was hampered even further by the camera restrictions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, this is where I'm like, uh, did we watch a different film? I don't, uh, well, we, we're also, uh, you know, 90 years removed. That is true. Yeah. I, I find it funny because when I talk to people in contemporary times about this, the number one thing that people say is that it's actually too stagey, that they can feel the restrictions of shooting on a single set. And while it is a technical marvel, it feels like we're just watching a play. I mean, that's what we say about so many films that are adapted from plays. I mean, I, I'm not promoting Roman Polanski here, but go look at Roman Polanski's Carnage, which is Kate Winslet, John C. Riley, Jodie Foster, and Christoph Waltz, set entirely in an apartment based on a Tony Award winning play, but it also feels like you're watching a play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just, I don't always view that as a negative, personally. I, I don't. Yeah, I think, hmm. You know what? I don't even know how to quantify it because sometimes it does work for me and other yeah. times I'm like, I feel claustrophobic. I mean, I, I think it's maybe a, it's case by case, right? Like, is the action on screen captivating enough to where it doesn't matter if you feel claustrophobic mm -hmm. in here, you know? Yeah. Or if claustrophobia is the intention. Yeah. I think the reason that it works for me here is because the camera movement keeps me entertained. It's when it's too static and it's the focus is just on dialogue, that's when I start to kind of drift off a little bit. So I actually really appreciate Hitchcock keeping the camera going. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, I, mean, I don't really have anything else on production or release. That's kind of it. Obviously, we have a bunch of gay shit to go through, but mm -hmm. I guess we'll kind of go through that with the plot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to introduce a couple of readings that I'll refer to on and off throughout this. So one of them is Scott Badman and Connie Russell Hosier. And they wrote a piece for Menza called Gay Coding in Hitchcock Film. So if you're interested in exploring Hitchcock's oeuvre, film by film, in terms of queer content, this is a pretty good piece. But they do have a, a fairly lengthy section on rope. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to bring in David Grevin's piece called Making a Meal of Manhood, Revisiting Rope and the Question of Hitchcock's Homophobia. And I'm actually not going to talk too much about the homophobia angle because, well... This film doesn't necessarily make queers come off very well. You know, they're associated with murder and narcissism and egotism and thinking that they're better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't find Hitchcock's films to be particularly homophobic. I think they have readings that can interpret them as coming down on queers. But by all accounts, Hitchcock himself was not anti-queer like there was a reason he kept casting principally gay men in a lot of his films yes he does make them villains but he is also dealing with the Hayes code i i find it very murky yeah i mean and there's you know obviously we've already said a bunch of changes between the play and the film but also i forgot to mention the the play ends inconclusively where the the james stewart character he's like in a moral quandary he doesn't know what to do because he's like well you're right Mm -hmm. whereas this the film obviously had to be like no the murderers have to go to jail it has to yeah. be implied that they go to jail yes yeah this is <laughs> this is what you need to do in order to satisfy joseph breen which again go back to our discussion on rebecca because they changed a very significant aspect of that novel to adapt it to the screen mm -hmm. yeah same restrictions mm -hmm. okay so Shall we talk about the sex scene that opens this film, Trace? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we're getting to the queer shit right off the top because I, this murder is a threesome. I, yes. Yeah, so I, I have a quote, and this is, uh, this is uh, from an article called How Hitchcock's Classic Mystery Rope Cleverly Depicted Queer Life. And this is for Owl.com, written by Armand White. And this is not really a critic that I like. I, no. I, was, <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck him. <laughs> no, I know. I associate him. He's, he's like the one guy that gave a bad review to get out. Yeah, he torpedoes every, every good movie with bad reviews. He's kind of a dick. He's terrible. He's, he's up there with Rex Reed for me. But Oh, God. More queer, <laughs> bad queers. Bad gays. Uh, but yeah, 
no, he, he writes, the film opens audaciously with Philip and Brandon strangling their victim, who's screaming in close-up. It is a petite mort, and of course, if anyone's seen Bride of Chucky, we know that is uh, orgasm in French. Uh, <laughs> or in the you middle... just know French. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know French. <laughs> yes, we've established that repeatedly. <laughs> but yes, in the middle of a murderous afternoon threesome. And even when we cut to this guy's face, like it's like a look of ecstasy on, the, on his face, mm-hmm. which... I mean, if we're talking Hellraiser, you know, pain and pleasure interchangeable. Oh, sure, sure. I'm actually going to piggyback on that with Badman and Russell Hosier. So they say the murder sex occurs behind curtain windows. The death scream corresponds to the orgasm, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then the murderers, Brandon and Philip, quickly put the body in a cabinet and go into a post-coital exhaustion. Philip doesn't even want the light turned on. In an inspired touch, Hitchcock has Brandon light a cigarette, a standard Hollywood indicator for... We just had sex. We just had sex. Um, there's a line later, though, where because we, where Brandon asks Philip, like, oh, how, what did you feel? How do you feel? And Brandon says, I didn't really feel anything um, until it went limp. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, what went limp? And he meant the body or yes. the penis. <laughs> there are so many double entendres. And so honestly, many. I... I have to praise Lawrence because, again, that's coming from the screenwriter. Like, he is embedding all of this. And apparently when they were doing the the translation from the UK to the American, they had to take out or move a bunch of language because what would have been regular conversation pieces, like the way that the men refer to each other – in the UK, it would have been fine, but when you translate it over, it all sounded super gay. Uh, yeah. Because it was like, hey, my boy, and it's like, oh, you wouldn't call your friend my boy. <laughs> yeah, well, and th- that's where, like, there's, like, a, I-, I was going to say generational divide, but it's, like, a century's worth of time. <laughs> no, no, not a century, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, like, 70, but uh, nope, 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 what, 60s, 80 years, 80 years difference is where we are. <laughs> there we go. But yeah, it's like, oh, maybe that's just how they talked back then. I don't know. But yeah, no, it, it's there. Some of this is definitely there. So as I mentioned before, I do enjoy film noirs as well as screwball comedies. So those are both from around this period. And they kind of have a rat-tat-tat way of talking. Right. And the dialogue does sound very similar. So this is, to a certain extent, conventional Hollywood fare. But some of the word play, I find, is particularly queer. Well, even the performances here, though, like it does sometimes feel like the people here are playing to the back row, which is Mm. common in plays with these performances. So I actually really like Farley Granger's Philip a lot. I wish he had more to do in this film Mm -hmm. because the the main player very much is John Dahl's Brandon. And the whole time I was watching him, I was because he I don't know if he's a a, a trained stage actor or not, but he is so articulate. And very big, right? Like, the personality is large. He's jumping off the screen. Well, and I was trying to go, I was like, he reminds me of somebody. And literally, it it is a combination of Jason Sudeikis (laughs) mixed with Hugo Weaving, but specifically Hugo Weaving's Agent Smith from the Matrix movies. Okay, that is very specific. I was like, what does he remind me of? Because he has, like, the shape and the lips of of Jason Sudeikis, but, like, he talks like Agent Smith. (laughs) interesting yeah those lips are huge yeah i mean he has a very big mouth too so i find because he has so much dialogue i'm just constantly staring at the big mouth yeah no i i'm right there with you (laughs) i'm not saying it's a bad thing by the way it's just like i become almost transfixed yes it it is eye-catching to say the least (laughs) oh my god we sound like the biggest pervs right now i know i know Oh, but wait, I'm sorry. Also, how about the happy score that plays over the opening credits? Mm-hmm, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It, it sounded like to, like your classical Hollywood cinema, like, whoo, 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 whoo. Oh, yeah. And then, We're boom, just, cut to murder. Yeah, <laughs> it's just an average Saturday afternoon <laughs> in New York City. <sighs> oh, boy. So, these men have murdered... It's revealed later that David, the person that they murdered, he is an old school friend of his. And they actually debated which of their old school friends they were going to kill. So Kenneth was on the chopping block. But I think ultimately they just felt like David was so boring he didn't deserve to live. Yeah. I mean, we we have this whole... Mon- I mean, you know, we have about 10, 15 minutes before guests start arriving at this party. And we have this whole thing where Brandon is like, he A, wants to preserve the crystal that David drank out of because Mm -hmm. it's a souvenir. And then... Oh, because of the choice dialogue, he would hate to break up the set. Yeah. (laughs) So gay. (laughs) 
<laughs> but then he's also like posthumously shitting on this guy's choice of drink mm-hmm. because he drank whiskey last when it would have been more appropriate for ginger ale or beer. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it is so funny how manners driven Brandon is. So he's very much like, oh, well, everyone is beneath us. So every choice that they make from their sense of fashion, from their sense of drink, from the books that they're reading, they are all susceptible to uh, mockery because Brandon thinks that he is just that much better. Actually, oh, I have a good read. Actually, (laughs) it's also from Armand White. (laughs) Okay. But no, but he says, rope story of one-upmanship and intellectual warfare among a particular class of gay men, because again, this is not every gay man, is ultimately universal. It shows extraordinary insight, subtly re- observing mid-20th century gay behavior. The film's greatest suspense is in its recognition of secret, furtive lust. Certainly Hitchcock and Lawrence knew such hookups as part of modern urban life. Sure. Just because it's the 40s doesn't mean people aren't fucking. But yeah, and also, like, you know, we have Brandon really infantilizing Philip a lot. The the first moment of I I really caught was when he pulls off his gloves for him. Yeah, there's something sexual in that moment. And, of course, everything also becomes a clue where you're waiting to see what's going to trip them up. But there's a tenderness as well as an infantilization there. Yeah. I can see that. Okay, so as they're talking, they discuss their plans. So they're going to put this body in the trunk. They're going to keep it throughout the dinner party, but then they're going to go and dump it at Brandon's mom's cottage cabin. House in Connecticut. In Connecticut. (laughs) This mythic house that we keep hearing about. Mm -hmm. Yes, where uh, Philip will also be going so that he can recuperate because he is a trained pianist. He's going to be doing a big show. So that's their kind of alibi slash get out of town free card Mm -hmm. but of course the lock on the trunk is broken and they don't hide the rope very well so there's all these things that we're keeping an eye on as voyeuristic spectators waiting to see what's going to trip them up they also make a drink at this point to kind of toast and celebrate so they open a bottle of champagne a seemingly endless bottle of champagne (laughs) oh god yeah that they get so much mileage out of that uh, if you took a shot Every time someone, like, gasped at the fact that they were drinking champagne in this movie, you would die. Mm -hmm. Well, don't forget that this is only three years after the war. So Mm. some of these are luxury items that people might still be getting accustomed to again. That makes sense. And also, if it's true champagne, it's, like, from champagne. Yes, in France. (laughs) France. I knew that. (laughs) So speaking of the champagne, I'm going to pull in Badman and Russell Hosier again. So Brandon handles the champagne bottle positioned between them as they stand close together. P.S. Everybody stands super close together because of the way they're filming, but particularly these two. So much close proximity, so much fuck eyes. I I wrote in my notes, I was like, while pouring champagne, they're so fucking close to each other. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wrote that exact line in my notes. (laughs) Oh, God, they are so close together and you're just like maybe just kiss just just yeah. the ones you know for us mm-hmm. okay so brandon holds its neck fiddling with its tip but he never gets the cork off he stops to get the champagne glasses then fiddles more something phallic is going on finally in a piece of thinly veiled symbolism philip takes the bottle and pops the cork <laughs> you're doing it wrong let me just do it myself <laughs> let me give you a hand <laughs> I'll, get my, I'll finish myself. <laughs> uh, you'll never think of champagne the same way. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes, uh, this is where we get the whole murder as a f- art form. Uh, it was an immaculate murder because, of course, it was done so perfectly. Brandon is such a fucking narcissist thinking that he's going to pull this off. Insert jack off motion here, right? Uh, maybe even over the champagne bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Probably in the champagne bottle. Oh, God. Uh, but yes, yeah, so they, they have performed this murder because they are not ordinary. And the word comes up quite frequently. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, this is when he talks about how he felt. They discuss the dinner party that they're hosting and who's going to be coming. So, of course, they had to invite David's parents, his <laughs> former girlfriend, Janet, who was played by Joan Chandler, as well as her former love, Kenneth, who was played by Douglas Dick. And even going back to the not ordinary, like they might as well be saying not normal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, coded language. But yeah, this whole thing, it's like, oh, wow. Like it, Honestly, this, even if you like, let's say for a second that you were like, yeah, sure. Like murderers, kill David, whatever. Okay. Even at this point, though, you, if you're thinking that you're like, okay, but really y'all are going to invite the family? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so fucked up. These guys are assholes. Oh, it's very fucked up. Yeah. 
and the simple fact that they think that they not only will get away with it, but that everyone else will be too fucking stupid. Like, Brandon actually says, everyone that we invited is so boring. That's why I had to invite Rupert, because he's the only one who stands a chance of catching us. He, it's sociopathic behavior, like 101. Like, he, he is a sociopath. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So Brandon collects the books that are going to provide the excuse for having this dinner party, and he takes them off of the trunk so that they can then use this as a dining room table instead of the typical dining room table. And this is where we first start to see Philip panicking because he sees the rope sticking out of the trunk. Uh, also, like Diabolique reference, by the way, with this. Oh, my God. I think I messaged you after I watched this and was like, did we mention this when we covered Diabolique? Because Diabolique is definitely seven years after this movie. Yes. So, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that Rob stole it from Diabolique. <laughs> Hitchcock could see the future. Just more, I can't believe that we didn't realize, oh, it's two queer lovers who hide mm -hmm. a body in a trunk and then try to just bald face, move it through a population of people risking getting caught at every junction and listeners i will let y'all know that diabolique is one of our uh i'm not gonna say worst performing but it's not in the high ranking i'm sorry it's actually the worst performing episode of, of quarter one so i would actually recommend if you enjoyed rope please go and double feature it with diabolique because they would make a great double feature and i i believe we even said in that episode that diabolique heavily inspired hitchcock to make psycho mm-hmm yeah so you know and also Girl That's Scary are fantastic guests, and you should listen to it for them alone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're great. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is when we get the introduction of Miss Wilson, who is played by Edith Evanson. She is the housekeeper, which to me is like, oh, and they're also loaded gays. <laughs> and, okay, living together, right? Presumably, yes. I mean, I'm sure that they would have separate bedrooms. I mean, I obviously, we know this is Brandon's place for sure. But mm -hmm. yeah, like, I would assume Philip lives here with him. But it's never really stated. Again, you have to kind of infer it. It's not. And we don't really see bedrooms, per se. We, we hear of a bedroom and we see Janet and Kenneth talking. But I don't, like, we don't get a fixed geography. It's not one of the rooms we really go in. Yeah. Yeah, so Miss Wilson is a very unhappy that they are using the trunk. She does not understand this at I, all. Well, okay, because not only so, I would assume if they were using the dining room table, they would all be sitting at said table, right? Mm -hmm. Well, although Philip does make a reference later when he's trying to chastise her when she's talking to Rupert, and he says, well, people would have had to get their food and bring it in here anyway. So maybe the intention was always to eat in the living room. Right, like it was always going to be this kind of buffet of sorts I with, think so. with champagne. <laughs> I guess so. They did things differently back in the 40s. No, when you talk about people that are like shot like when they're standing close together, there is a shot later in the film where it's uh, it's brandon and david's dad and then i want to say the aunt like sitting on the couch together mm -hmm. but david's dad is like smushed oh, yeah. <laughs> between the two people on his sides <laughs> <laughs> there is not enough furniture to accommodate this many people <laughs> mm -mm, mm -mm. so this is where brandon describes the trunk as a ceremonial altar for a sacrificial dinner oh god jack off motion Right. Uh, the other fun thing that you could think of, and this is what Lawrence describes it as, the, the screenwriter Lawrence, he says, oh, well, actually what they're doing is they're preparing a dinner over top of a coffin. Interesting. And see, I actually viewed the, 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 the chest as more of a closet of sorts because, mm -hmm. like, you know, the whole movie, oh, we have two gay men keeping a secret. Don't open the closet because you don't want something to come out of said closet. Yeah, it, it's interesting, actually. I did find a couple of people who talk about that explicitly. So Les Fabian Braithwaite for IndieWire says the entire film acts as a metaphor for homosexuality sexuality a secret hiding in plain sight that the two men hope won't yet somehow will get exposed mm -hmm. i don't know i i thought that that was interesting that part of this is like it's not even that they think they'll get away with it it's like hey are you reading the signs yes we've committed a murder also we're gay <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're, they're testing the waters like how far can we go without having the secret get out <laughs> what's worse we committed murder or we are fucking each other but let's <laughs> what, what's the most public place we can fuck without getting caught right oh my god they're sexual voyeurs <laughs> Uh, okay, so through the swinging door, we see that Brandon drops the rope in a kitchen, 
uh, drawer. And then Philip is upset to learn that Rupert Cadell, who is played by Jimmy Stewart, their headmaster from prep school, is also going to be coming to the dinner. So Brandon is the worst kind of boyfriend, where he's literally springing things on his paramour at every Constantly. opportunity. No, he's a dick. He's a terrible boyfriend. A terrible boyfriend. Not only should you not force your boyfriend to commit murder, but you should definitely not bring in an authority figure that they don't know is coming. Well, and one thing that I wish, like, because honestly, we, we really see Philip up like nervous and anxious the entire movie. We, yeah. I wish somehow there was a way to see him in the planning stages where he was like gung ho, like, yep, we're going to do this because... Mm-hmm. It, as it stands, it just reads as, oh, yeah, like, like Brandon basically forced him to do this, which which maybe is what it is. But I wish we could have seen Philip pre-murder to see, like, if he did, like, a, a one, like, a turnaround, like a switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you definitely don't get a sense of who he is before all of this, where you very right. distinctly get the impression that this is who Brandon always is. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> always a dick. Constant. <laughs> All right, so the guests begin arriving, and Kenneth is first. This guy is just a blank walking around this movie. He is so forgettable. Uh, <laughs> I thought he was cute. Um, but yes. Oh, sure, he's cute, but also I'm like, oh, he looks exactly like David. Are we sure that we didn't just have the actor appear in multiple roles in this movie? Well, and that's the thing, though, right? Because like, the whole thing, A, um, I love this actress that plays Janet, um, Joan Chandler. I actually think that her role is quite... Like, I, I like watching her on screen, and oh, I like that she's, she's a, fucking great. Yeah, but she stands up for herself too. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. like she like calls Brandon on his shit. I'm like, yeah, but the whole gag is that yeah, she she left Kenneth for David because Kenneth just was boring. <laughs> mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, I feel like if they redid this movie and modernized it, there's a throwaway line where when she discovers that Kenneth is there because she clearly didn't really know who was coming to this party. She drags Brandon aside and she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Why is my ex here? And he says, oh, I didn't realize you two had broken up. Oh, I didn't realize you were a thing. Like, it's total bullshit. No, he's playing these mind games with everyone, Mm -hmm. which again, um, you know, (laughs) fun, fun gay men. Sure, sure. (laughs) But yeah, uh, also, I mean, backing up a little bit to when we have the rope sticking out of the damn trunk, like he carries it to the kitchen, swinging it around as if it's his dick flailing around, like just to be like, because I can. Yeah. That's who Brandon is. Well, so the point I was trying to make about his relationship to Janet is when he says, oh, I didn't realize that you two used to date. He basically slut shames her in 1948 language when he he says, oh, well, first you dated me and Mm -hmm. then you went to Kenneth and then you went to David. And I thought, hey, that's really interesting that we're we're getting this kind of misogyny this Mm -hmm. early on. But also the fact that you know, I, I suppose we could then read Brandon as bisexual, bisexual. Yeah. or that he has been interested in doing these kinds of power plays for so long that he's like either setting things up in advance or he's using this as an opportunity to seek retribution against Janet. Well, that's where we have the sociopathy coming in, right? Like, do we actually think that Brandon feels for anyone? No, no. he just wants to show superiority. He, he doesn't have actual like emotions towards his people outside of like i'm better than you Mm -hmm. yeah and and i guess that's another piece where it might have been interesting to see the planning of the murder because we don't get a good read on the relationship between brandon and philip did he actually like does brandon actually like or love philip because he doesn't show a lot of sympathy or well, uh, support I, for him. It's honestly, it's it's reminiscent of just a toxic, uh, toxic relationship. Not in general, but also a toxic gay relationship. Of let's say you're a more seasoned gay who's been out for a while, taking in a new baby gay under his wing and manipulating <laughs> him to do what he wants because he knows he can. Because it, someone that's fresh out of the closet, like they're gonna have a lot of like. Like, there's a lot of things going on there. And so right. that's kind of what this reminded me of is like an old, not old, but like a, a creep, like taking advantage of a freshly out gay man. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the conversation that we had about Midnight Kiss when we talked about it on Patreon. Yep. 100% just like that. <sighs> okay. But but that even stems, you know, from like, uh, oh, I mean, this is like a rabbit hole kind of thing, but it's like, uh-uh. uh, no, but it's like, you know, I'm trying to say it the nice way. A lot of. Queer people, not even just gay men, but like I'll, I'll use gay men because that's my lived experience, that are closeted for let's say you know the first thirty years of their lives, and they come out in their thirties. They're then they're kind of you know spinning their thirties, being themselves for the first time, living their teenage years, you might say, mm. in their thirties. 
but there's still psychological damage that's been done. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. For having to hide yourself for however long. I mean, again, even me, I came out at 16, but like, you know, I was still hiding myself for a good chunk of time. And that does things to your mind. Uh, not necessarily doesn't mean it's going to be like make you a sociopath but <laughs> <laughs> probably not no but i do think that there's kind of like a thing i um, mean in, in at least gay male relationships where you have people that will take advantage of people that are freshly out because they can yeah i mean this definitely feels like a power imbalance particularly as mm-hmm. the film goes on yes absolutely i mean philip just like i mean I think he stands up for himself once, and it's during the chicken conversation. Yeah, and and even then, it's like an emotional outburst, which is akin to the conversation we had with Terry a couple of weeks ago when we talked about how, yeah. you know, people become hysterical, and then they become feminized, or, yeah. or they're treated as effeminate and delicate and sensitive and so on. Yeah, stop being a little bitch. Don't be a little girl. Well, it's important to note that Brendan does slap Philip at one point when he becomes too hysterical. He sure does. Yeah. Okay, so we're still in the early stages of this party. We haven't welcomed all of the guests, but this is when we introduce uh, that Rupert is going to be joining because nobody else knows Rupert except for the boys who went to prep school. Mm -hmm. So Brandon and Philip tell the others what to expect, which is that Rupert is steeped in philosophy. So he has written books about it. And I love Janet's description, small print, big words, no sales. (laughs) Oh, which is, uh, I mean, not to shit on academia, but I feel like I can because I work in it. But I'm just like, oh, yes, uh, we've all read those papers or those books. <laughs> I, I honestly, what, cause, because this is my first time watching this film, I actually thought that this body was going to get revealed when everyone was still there. Uh, okay. And I kind of wish that would have happened. I mean, I get the whole idea, you know, we have to have it between these three men because that's that's what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. But I wish that we would have seen other people's reactions to this body. Right. Whereas it's tricky because it doesn't quite play this way. And again, Lawrence would say that Hitchcock undermined the whole principle of building tension. But you're supposed to be worried that the body could be discovered at any point. So you know it will be discovered because that's the premise of the film. But you're supposed to wonder if Janet would find it or if the housekeeper will find it and so on. Mm. The problem is, is that we we never worry. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe there's one scene. We'll talk about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's not a ton of close calls in this movie. I mean, the, yeah, yeah, I think the one you're talking about is when Mrs. Wilson is about to, like, possibly open the, the, the yes. chest. Yeah, correct. Okay, so we have two new guests arriving, and they are David's father, Mr. Kentley, played by Cedric Hardwick, as well as amateur astrologer Aunt Atwater, played by Constance Collier. She is a fucking hoot. Yeah, I I love this character. (laughs) (laughs) And basically because she's a ditz. She shows up, she has no idea what's going on. She, I mean, honestly, if we're thinking about a queer text and then a woman who just wants to read everybody's palms and talk about their horoscope, I was like, oh, wow, okay, we're we're really going gay on this. These hands will make you famous. (laughs) (laughs) I do like that she is so confused that she calls Kenneth by David's name, and that causes Philip to shatter his glass. So that's kind of the first sign. It's a it's a literal crack that Philip will not be able to handle this pressure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we get a little bit of exposition about who David is, and everybody's wondering where he'll be. This was apparently an attempt to give the dead man a sense of character so that we would understand why people would be so upset and very worried about the fact that he hasn't arrived. I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, and th- this is really, yeah, this is the, oh, okay, let's get to know these characters a bit, too. Mm-hmm. I-, I also love, I mean, I'm going to say it's meta, but these references to James Mason and Cary Grant, I was like, that's <laughs> fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of people have interpreted the the something about something that uh, the aunt cannot remember the movie that she went to see. A lot of people have interpreted that as a reference to Notorious. Uh, well, yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. 1940s, uh-huh. Kevin Williamson. <laughs> Hitchcock is the original Kevin Williamson. <laughs> not really. I'm not actually saying that. Oh, people will kill us. Oh, indeed. Uh, there is a line by Brandon where he notices that Kenneth needs more champagne and he says, There's too much air in your glass, which is the term I'm going to use whenever I need to refill someone's drink moving forward. Oh, uh, okay. There you go. Too much air in your glass. Okay. Mm-hmm. Need a top up. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, so this is where Aunt Atwater is talking to Philip, and she compliments him on his hands, which, of course, is that double message. Like, you're going to be famous for your hands, which fucking murdered my nephew. Or because you're a famous pianist. <laughs> uh, it should be noted that Philip plays a piece on the piano for the entire film. It's the same piece over and over again. It is uh, Francis Poulenc's Perpetual Movement. And uh, just as a fun little aside, Francis Poulenc was a gay man. Gays everywhere. Indeed. All right. So enter the man of the hour, Rupert Caudel. Just shows up, by the way. No knock. Like, he showed up and I was like, wait, was there an entrance for him? He just walks <laughs> in. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's just sneaking around like the master sleuth. Entitled gay. <sighs> okay. So let, let's address that right now. Because okay. when I found out that this character in the play is mm. actually queer, all I could do was feel a sense of grief about the film that we don't get as a result. Because if this character was gay in Rope, mm -hmm. I think it would have just added all of these additional complexities, darling. Like, this would have been so much richer thematically. I think it would have complicated a lot of the queer readings that we have for it. But I just think Jimmy Stewart is such a fucking stick in the mud in this movie. Well, so what do you mean by it would have spoiled some of the queer readings we had for this film, if this character was queer? Well, because it would have been kind of like what you mentioned earlier. It's an older man grooming his his students, because the insinuation is that he has slept with Brandon. Right. So I can totally see that. But then I can also see it as like, I don't I don't really know how I would say it complicates it. Because to me, it's like, cool, it's a cycle. Because I, mm. I mean, granted, I do think that Brandon and Philip are probably more closer in age than like yes. Brandon and Rupert. But Brandon seems older. So it's like, okay, like this this cycle of I'm gonna say abuse almost. Yeah. Uh, uh, of Rupert grooming Brandon and then Brandon grooming Philip. Right. But we see we don't even get that then we just no. get Oh, well, here's this one sociopathic gay who corrupts his boyfriend and blah. Yeah, I mean, again, inviting Rupert in general was a really stupid idea. Like, that, that's, oh God, some, yeah. that's some grand hubris right there. Oh, God, yeah. That's asking to be caught, which is, where are you going? <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> I do love it that in the real case, in the play, and then also in the movie, they think they're that they're not even going to get caught, and then they get caught within hours of committing well, the move the no that's I mean, honestly that's that's another thing for me too like it, when they get caught like it it happens so fast mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, and i think i think that's where me where some people when they complain about the tension of the suspense is like okay like yeah there, there's not really a ton of suspense honestly in the first hour of this movie for me because it's like well it's not gonna happen yet <laughs> okay interesting yeah that's not how you're meant to feel I don't think. I, and and maybe on a rewatch, I'll feel differently. Mm, no, I don't think so. Because it's <laughs> it's very clear that they're not going to get caught until later. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I, I still like watching the characters. So that's fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a testament to not just the actors who are doing it, but also, as I've mentioned, the, the screenwriting. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so everyone has now arrived. Um, there is a quick hint that Brandon has been planning this for quite some time because his favorite story was the mistletoe bow, which is uh, basically how to commit a murder and get away with it that he's been talking about since he was a child. So <laughs> sociopath. Okay, we get a scene where Janet serves chicken. And when Philip says that he doesn't eat uh she says that that's queer and then yes. mentions freud says there's a reason for everything it should be noted that uh freudian psychology was very popular in the mid to late 40s well and i will pull a piece from decider uh this is when hitchcock went gay strangers on a train and rope by tyler coates and it should also be noted that farley granger who plays philip was also in strangers on the train yes he's the villain <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Coates writes, the motif of queer sexuality in Rope is, at times, hilariously obvious, especially when Rupert brings up Brandon's youthful penchant for murdering chickens on an acquaintance's farm. Mm -hmm. Especially when Rupert brings up Philip's youthful penchant for murdering chickens on an acquaintance's farm. Philip tries to deny he ever did such a thing, but Brandon announces that he knows he has not just once but multiple times, you're quite a good chicken strangler, as I recall, is an actual line of dialogue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nothing, uh, nothing Freudian or euphemism in there. Choking the chicken? Uh, yeah, that's actually where we're at, the, the chicken story. Um, so 
I feel like that's a bit of an attempt to suggest, oh, well, Philip has also always had this murderous yeah. impulse, but he is more actively open to denying it because, of course, this is when he has his fit that that didn't happen. He denies it. The whole story is false. Yeah, but you could also, uh, I mean, if we really, I mean, this is a, this is a reach, obviously, for me, but um, like, it, say, oh, like, maybe they're accusing him of being gay. And he's like, no, it wasn't. I didn't. I'm not gay. Right. Yeah. You can conflate murder with gay, sadly, quite a bit throughout this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is where we get the the overview, the philosophical underpinnings of uh, the Nietzschean Superman, the Uberwinch, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of funny dialogue here from Jimmy Stewart about like, oh, have you found it difficult to get uh, theater tickets? Wouldn't it be great if we could just stab people or slit their throats? And uh, you know, the ant is having a good old giggle about it, but Mister Kentley gets very upset about this, and he drops. A reference to Nazism here. Oh. And I wanted to flag it because, uh, again, this is coming three years after the end right. of the Second World War. And I I don't know if it was Lawrence who put it in here or if it was Hitchcock, but uh, I just wanted to flag for people that Hitchcock had actually produced a documentary about the genocide committed by the Nazis who used Nietzsche's Superman as one of the reasons why they committed genocide in the second world war. Mm. So I, I think it's a very deliberate decision by Hitchcock after seeing just the absolute atrocities that were happening in the concentration camps that he wanted to make it clear, like, no, this is not a valid reason. Like anybody who is using this is misconstruing the philosophy, but also fuck Nazis basically. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I did catch that. <laughs> <laughs> it is literally a line in this film. <laughs> God. Okay, so uh, Kenneth and Janet realize that Brandon is lying to them. So when she confronts him for a second time, he drops this line on oh, her. Oh, I know exactly what you're about to say, and I totally wrote it down. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Some women are quite charming when they're angry, Janet. Unfortunately, you are not. Oh my god! I like mic drop out the room. Right? She like her face. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I make her the star of this movie. She's great. Ah, oh, she's so fantastic. I love it too. Is, is you know when you look at a film from 1948. I mean, again, if you're watching certain types of films, you are going to see assertive modern women, but her character feels really fresh. Like, I feel like you wouldn't even need to do much to change Janet to make her modern if you remade this film now. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> okay, that's not the response I was thinking. You were gonna get. <laughs> okay. I don't know, I don't know, I yeah. don't know, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So uh, Ms. Wilson, who has a thing for Rupert, apparently, uh, they get like co-conspiratorial as they're talking a little bit about the party prep here. And this is kind of when the suspense does ratchet up for me a little bit because yes. like, we, we we are building to something. People are acting weird. People are, I mean, it really kind of starts with that murder talk because David's dad gets all freaked out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like from here on out, like we are kind of like, okay, like we're moving, we're moving. Well, and you can actively see Rupert collecting the pieces of evidence and taking note of, you know, when Philip has an outburst, you, the camera will actually focus on Rupert's face as he like pays attention. So you can see him putting the pieces together mentally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she fills in this, all of the facts about like, oh, yeah, they weren't going to use this trunk. Oh, they sent me up for a really long time. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you know, very suspicious behavior. So uh, this is where the, the truth about the chicken strangling comes out when he quizzes Philip about it. And Philip is like, da, 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 just See, playing piano. <laughs> this is a good little like back and forth, though, between them, because yeah. it is clear Philip is not holding his own. <laughs> mm -mm. He's so curt, too. You're like, uh, dude, you're supposed to be the meek one. And yet you're boldly asking get the light out of my face i don't like playing piano with light in my face but like okay so we have this entire exchange which again yeah it's it's basically rupert is like police interrogating him but, mm -hmm. and he's acting like a real dick about it too oh yeah yeah but then we have david's father walking out of the dining room with the books that he wants tied mm -hmm. with the rope with yeah. the titular rope 
it almost feels like Brandon wants to break Philip by just yes. doing all of these little things like, uh, this is going to send him into a tailspin. No, I mean, that's a that's toxic relationship, right? He's like, oh, I know this is going to bother Philip, so let me do it. So mm-hmm. it's not even just let me come as close as I can to getting caught without getting caught. It's also let me drive my partner nuts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So this is where we get one of the few moments in the entire film where Hitchcock isn't moving the camera, and it's the kind of static shot as we watch Mrs. Wilson dropping off the books in between rooms, and I love the framing. I do think that this is where the tension you're right really starts to ratchet up, and it's the moment where we come closest to discovery, because she starts to open the chest, but of course, uh, Brandon is there, and he's like, oh, why don't you go home? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this is also where David's distraught mother calls. I do love that we never meet her. We never uh, really get to know anything about her. She's at home sick. <laughs> yeah. And so so the dad's like, well, I got to bring somebody. So I might as well bring the aunt. Yeah, indeed. Because heaven forbid you arrive to a party by yourself. <laughs> it's the uh, 40s. So the party is basically breaking up because they're realizing something is very wrong. No one has heard from David. The mother is now getting hysterical. So everybody starts to kind of pack up. This is where Brandon smugly observes that Kenneth is leaving with Janet. (laughs) Fucking Brandon. (laughs) And this is where Rupert is given David's hat by accident. Yes. Yes. Which at that point, I mean... He could have just said right then and there, but he doesn't. Why? Mm -hmm. I think because he's not 100% certain, but I think he also wants to do this when no one else is around. Again, why? (laughs) (laughs) Because he also kind of thinks of himself as a bit of a Superman. Yeah, yeah, and he's also gay and he wants to keep it in the family. (laughs) Okay, Jimmy Stewart is so fucking asexual, I can't even get a sexual (laughs) reading off of him. Okay, I I, I, I said earlier, I know his voice is, and the inflection of his voice is very, very specific. Oh, Mary! I I, I have heard a lot of, I want to see even like Looney Tunes, like I feel like I've heard Looney Tunes like do his voice because they they would do that all the time. So Mm -hmm. I think this is the first time I've ever, ever actually heard the actual Jimmy Stewart's voice. Right, but you've heard it a million times in other ways. Yes, 100%. Yeah. But I was just very like, uh, I don't like that. <laughs> oh, it's a very distinct voice. To the point where you're like, wow, so you survived into talkies, huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, says I with, like, my voice. I mean, it's, I, not, not to say Jimmy Stewart, I, I mean, you know, obviously respected actor, blah, 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 blah. Um, but... <laughs> It just doesn't really work for me. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Academy Award winning actor. Super famous. Uh, but that voice. Isn't he the villain in North by Northwest, too? I mean, he's the hero of North by Northwest, yes. I thought Cary Grant was the hero of North by Northwest. Oh, shit. He's the hero of her window. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, my God. People are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> Honestly, Hitchcock blondes, but also Hitchcock generic hot men. Just like, yeah. he, it's like, oh, do you have a good chest? Do you have a bland face? Do you have a full head of hair? Okay. Cool. Your cast. But Cary Grant has charisma that blows Jimmy Stewart out of the water. All right. And also potentially bisexual. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so I'm going to reference Armin White's piece at this point. So when Miss Wilson leaves, she's one of the last people to leave. She, I mean, she's a bit of a comic tragic figure because she's so dutiful right like she actually likes these two boys and when she leaves she tells brandon you know to be good and then she says mind your p's and q's and i it's such an antiquated saying like no one would ever say it anymore so it did stand out to me but armin white says oh if you think about p's and q's it does actually stand for a multiplicity of different types of things but in this film he reads it as cueing you towards the number of mentions that we've heard of the word peculiar as well as queer. queer. So it's just another opportunity to be like, hey, have you been minding the P's and the Q's in this film? <laughs> Keep yourself closeted, boys. <laughs> yeah, don't get up to anything I wouldn't do. No butthole play. Oh my god. Can you imagine? <laughs> That's the porn parody of Rope. Oh, what would you call it? Rope. Uh... Oh, also, I should point out, <laughs> Every time I was Googling rope in Google, Mm -hmm. the autofill was rope play for me. Oh, what have you been up to? I not that I mean again no kink shaming it's fine I just never thought to look up rope play but <laughs> maybe I've just been watching enough porn that they're like oh yeah he'll want that maybe yeah I don't know I mean sales did skyrocket after Fifty Shades of Grey yep that's true 
<laughs> Not even joking, really. But no, no, no. I, I, I believe you. <laughs> all those uh, those fifty year old women. Well, all those people thinking that they could just go to you know places that sell regular conventional rope, and it's like, yeah, I'll use this to let my lover tie me up. It's like, no, no. it's supposed to be a specific kind. <laughs> yeah, not the not the one that's gonna scratch up your wrist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh my god, I'm also thinking about all like the, the the number of like really sexy contractual obligate uh, agreement scenes that that were played out in real time with all these people. Oh yes, <laughs> can you deliver that rope to me? <laughs> it's the best scene of Fifty Shades of Grey is that damn contract scene. It's oh the best scene. God, but. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So the party is officially over. We are left with just Brandon and Philip. So Philip gets absolutely fucking smashed at this point, yep. and he gets real mad. So um, this is where Rupert then calls and says, "Hey, I forgot my cigarette case. Can I come back up?" And uh, it requires a slap. Yeah, this is, yeah, like, snap out of it, but, like, not. Mm -hmm, But not funny. But but, but this is also when we kind of have Brandon, he's like, no, because he says, I am not going to get caught because of you or anyone else. No Mm -hmm. one is going to get in my way now. There is no our anymore. It is my. And I would almost argue that it was always Brandon's way and that. I think he was yes. prepared to dump Philip the same way that he was going to dump David's body in that Connecticut lake. I'm actually surprised he doesn't just flat out throw Philip under the bus, like, during this climax. Uh-huh. I think the problem is, is that Rupert wouldn't believe it, because it's so obviously Brandon's plan. Yeah, because we had that line earlier, though, where he's like, oh, you stutter when you're excited? Yes. I think it is excited. Mm-hmm. It is excited. Just like a first date. Yeah, or when you're sexually stimulated. Yeah. Honestly, it's like, yes, we we could be accused of reaching as always, but nah. the wordplay in here is so queer-coded. Again, first time watch, I picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a reason that like it was banned, because it wasn't that hard for people to pick up. Like, yeah, you don't have to have them making out on the screen. Like, it was just like, no, people in the 40s were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dar that's going off, and I'm not sure what it is. I can't say it. Is it an it dar? Yep. The it dar. Oh, my God. (laughs) The love that shall not speak its name. It. It. (laughs) So when Rupert does come back up, he does have a very, it's another kind of coded, meaningful line where he says, I wish I could come straight out with what I want to know. Unfortunately, I don't know anything I merely suspect. And I'm like, are you talking about the murder or are you talking about the gay? Come straight, come straight. Um, No, so the line I pulled was, I suppose a psychoanalyst would say I didn't leave it at all, referring to a cigarette case. Right. But rather, I subconsciously left it here because I wanted to come back. Oh. And I I was like, romance Mm -hmm. in the air. Uh, See, again, imagine someone who isn't a sexual vacuum playing this part. (laughs) We don't even have big Jimmy Stewart fans listening to us. Oh my god. Tell you what, if you can find a sexy Jimmy Stewart movie, please recommend it to me because I have yet to see it. He is like America's sweetheart from the 40s. I've only seen this one, so... (laughs) Yeah, you're useless to me. I'm talking to other people. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. All right, so we're into the home stretch. This is basically where Rupert says, I know what's up, and he outlines how he would have killed David. And I love this part. So it's Mm -hmm. Hitch moving the camera as Rupert describes where David and the players would have moved around the apartment. So we can visualize how the murder took place And again, I do think this might have been more effective had we not actually seen the murder at the beginning, but Mm -hmm. it still works like gangbusters regardless. Okay. Uh, This is where Philip gets his, his, uh, his good comeback in. So he does belligerently break the glass and he cracks. Oh, actually, no, my favorite line of his is where uh, Rupert asks for the drink and then Philip goes, he said you could have it. (laughs) I mean, Philip Granger is also super fucking hot in this I movie. think he's so cute. Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't really find uh, uh, Dahl, like, uh, is it Phil? No, John Dahl that cute. But yes, uh, Philip Granger, uh, sorry, Farley Granger. Damn it. Uh, all about it. Philip Granger. We're just combining the character I and his so many names. <laughs> actor's name, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, th- this is really it, right? Like, we just like, oh, like, it's kind of like a, a face-off of words here. And... Mm-hmm. There's a brief struggle with a gun, but uh, Philip doesn't last long, so. No, he can't. He can't. Poor guy. That poor guy. No. 
So this is where Rupert opens the trunk. He gets confirmation that there is, in fact, a body in there. We, of course, don't see it because we already knew that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where he says that he's disgusted and that they have perverted all of his teachings. And he's so distraught with himself. But then he opens up the window. He fires the gun several times. uh, And And basically... That's the end of the movie because I mean, we, we just hear sirens. And I, I wonder if the play would have ended before he shoots the gun out the window. If he's just like, I like, uh, yeah, you've corrected me. You've taken my teachings, like twisted them around. Mm-hmm. But you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to bring in Grevin one final time, he reads this ending as Rupert almost allegorically represents the forces of normalization, repression, and containment that abolish the perverse energies of both the murderous couple and this languidly, diabolically pleasure-focused film. Okay, it's not really like flowing with our conversation here, but because people like to say that we reach sometimes, I want to re- I want to do one more of Miller's things because it's about specifically the cuts in the film and how they happen. Because uh, okay. A lot of times when we do cuts, you know, it's it's either A, we have a couple unmasked cuts, which means like you, we just cut from one one shot to the next. Like mm-hmm. that happens a couple times in this movie. But most of the time we're like going into someone's back yes. and filling the screen with black and like we come out and boom. So what D.A. Miller says, and again, this is in his 1990 essay, Anal Rope, um, he pinpoints how the transitions erotically reveal the homosexual relationship between Philip and David, but more importantly, the hidden identity of the gay male. Ironically, and probably noticeable only upon the second viewing of the film, one might observe that many of the transitions in the film are made by the camera panning into the backside of a man's suit. This is Hitchcock's Freudian slip, bringing Freud back. Though it is never said, it is felt. The viewer enters a noir area. This is the invitation to wonder, according to the film, what is gay sex? Under the cover of these blackouts, two things get quote-unquote hidden. One is the popularity, privilege site of gay male sex. The orifice whose sexual use general opinion considers, whatever happens to be the state of sexual practices among gay men, and however it may vary according to the time and place. The least dispensable element in defining the true homosexual. The other is the cut, whose pure technicity acclaim can hardly be sustained at so overwhelmingly hallucinatory a moment, even if the script didn't link the word with the body wound of irreducible symbolic importance. That's a lot of words. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've just got yeah going into a man's backside is is, is like the, is Hitchcock's way of like putting gay sex on film, right? Yeah, I don't know. it's an interesting idea. I mean, this is very much like where film theory and film criticism yes. kind of like. <laughs> Sometimes academics just love to use them $20 words when, you know, you basically summarize, okay, well, this is Hitchcock introducing queer sex into this, but also hiding his cut. And and this is, I mean, and that's why I say, you know, people accuse us of making reads, which we, 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 we make reaches all the time, but it's also in good fun a lot of the time. Whereas this is an academic text. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't completely disagree with that. I mean... Mm -hmm. You could have distilled it down to make it a little bit more approachable. But at the end of the day, one of the things that becomes really obvious in this film, as we talked about off the top, is just how obvious all of the technical elements of the film are. So we're very aware of when the, where and when the camera is moving, but we're also very aware, particularly at specific points, where we are hiding a cut. And it is, there's a couple of really obvious ones where you're not meant to see it, but yeah, we zoom in on a man's backside and the screen goes dark. And yeah. if anything, it it's Hitchcock trying to hide it, but it only makes it more obvious to us. It, it does make me wonder, though, is like the handful of unmasked cuts. Like, again, there's one where I think we're seeing Rupert, Brandon, and Philip, and then we just cut to Mrs. Wilson. Mm hmm. Why? Like, if we're working so hard to mask all these cuts, why are there, like, two or three cuts that aren't masked? W- was it for practicality? Was it a, a deliberate creative choice? Like, I don't, I wish I knew the answer to that question. And m- maybe, maybe it's out there. I don't know. Uh, there may be one insight. I can't remember where they all happen, but Hitch did have to go back and reshoot certain portions of this because the Technicolor wasn't done properly. Mm. He was apparently very pissed off, but as a result, <laughs> they did have to reshoot certain reels. So I wonder if maybe he just couldn't get the coverage he needed. So maybe. he had to do a traditional edit. 
Yeah. Oh, man, that would be so frustrating. Right? If, <laughs> if, if the idea walking into this was, no, it's going to look like one continuous take, and then, like, yeah, it fucks up, and you have to go reshoot things, and then mm-hmm. it doesn't work. Ooh, yeah. I'd be mad. Oh, and he is a fucking perfectionist, so he would have been irate. Oh, I'm sure. He's like, Jimmy Stewart, come over here. No! I'm not fucking <laughs> doing that shit again. <laughs> oh, <sighs> boy. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's rope. Mm-hmm. That's rope. Rope it up. I mean, what do you think of rope, Joe? <laughs> I like it. I mean, I said I went through a Hitchcock period. I mm-hmm. didn't actually see all of them, but I saw. There's a lot, though. There are, he was actually very prolific. Yeah. Yeah. I probably ended up seeing about half of them. I'd put this kind of in the middle. Like, it's good to watch every once in a while, but it's not a big favorite. I think if you were a person who appreciated the technical aspects of filmmaking, this would be a really fun kind of watch just because it happens so early. Well, yeah. early in quotation marks. It's like film had been around for quite a while at this point. But yeah, compared to our lived experience, it's like, oh, my God, this is 80 years ago. And they were trying these really audacious techniques like it's impressive. So I think if for no other reason, the film is great for that. But then also this is such a blatantly queer film Mm -hmm. from one of the most high profile Hollywood directors. And that's kind of impressive. Even if queers don't come off looking well, I do kind of applaud the fact that we had very explicit queer representation here. Well, and also, I mean, while it is Hitchcock directing the film, it's still a gay man that wrote this film. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, based on a play, but (laughs) right. But still, you know, I mean, like, and you have queer actors. I mean, there are queer people involved with this production. Yes. Now, granted, what they could do, because, again, it's 1948. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's not like if it was made today, you know, people would be like, um, excuse me, that may be a little, like, <laughs> maybe we tweak this aspect of it. Right. But the central premise of the film, like, if you, if you want to read this film as being harmful to gays uh, or, or, like, not putting them in the best light, I, it's valid. But it's also, like, that's the basic premise. So I don't know how you could, like, change anything here without, mm-hmm. like literally changing the story well or you you don't make them gay at all and then you're Mm -hmm. just telling a very conventional story about two boys who commit a murder but that's so much less interesting isn't right Mm -hmm. well but i'm thinking even thinking with like murder by numbers which guys i haven't seen murder by numbers in a very long time yeah but like there is very much like queer undertones with that and that's why we get that's why we get queer undertones with billy and stew as well like Mm -hmm. apparently no matter what (laughs) If you have two youthful yeah. men plotting a murder, doing it, and, like, trying to cover up their secret, mm-hmm. it just, no it matter what, it gay. just reeks gay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I I liked this quite a bit. I didn't love it, but I, I, I do want to rewatch it just because I want to see if, if I'm able to, like, not let the camera distract me and mm-hmm. pay more attention to the dialogue. You know, I mean, like, this is your, like, not your first time watching this, so... Uh, uh, also, maybe I should watch it with subtitles. I'll pull a U and watch it with <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> I'm just shouting it from the rooftop, folks. Watch everything with subtitles. You pick up a lot, especially in dialogue-heavy movies. Oh, yeah. Well, because also, if you have subtitles on, you're also your eyes are focused on the words, mm-hmm. not the mo- mo- the movement of the camera. The, the moo of the camera. <laughs> ah, the moo of the camera. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I thought this is this is a good watch, and I'm glad to finally cross this off my bucket list. There you go. Yeah, we're slowly making our way through the old classics, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that is Rope. And before we announce what we're covering next week, I guess we have our regular old housekeeping to get through. If you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers. Join our Facebook Horror Queers group to hang out with other listeners and find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. Uh, we've also got a YouTube channel for our Micro Queers episodes, which come out every other Friday. Uh, so be sure to go check those out. And if you have a moment, please rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice. If you would like even more horror queers content please support us and the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horror queers uh so you know go subscribe to that and you can listen to our august episodes on the boy behind the door old the night house and both don't breathes <laughs> ah the breezes <laughs> Plus, uh, if you subscribe at the highest level, you can get up to 130 hours of other bonus content. Oh, man, folks, there's a lot of good episodes on there. We try to do like a gentle plug throughout each episode, but it's mostly just because we don't think everybody knows how many episodes we have dropped on that Patreon. There's a lot of good stuff there. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, we, 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 it's almost like, like yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just yes. Yeah. 
but Joe, 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 <laughs> we we have a thing next week. I mean, not a thing. It's an, it's a regular episode. But <laughs> no, it's a thing, Trace. Oh my God, the clouds are parting. Yeah, we are coming home to Canada. It is time for another David Cronenberg. And folks, you're going to be shocked. It is a David Cronenberg I have not seen. Oh my god, we're covering the fly. Yay! We are fine. Okay, so if you have been with us since the beginning, or if you have listened to our early episodes, you'll know that one of our first episodes was on David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers. We Mm -hmm. also covered The Brood later that year. Yes. But yeah, Joe, in all of his, I love David Cronenberg shit, um, has never seen The Fly. And I'm so excited for him to finally see this movie. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, me too. Yes, the body horror, the icky gooey, and also the Jeff Goldblum of it all. Yes, and yeah, so obviously, yeah, this is the remake of The Fly. And if you have never seen this movie, um, not really content warnings, but it is a very gross Mm -hmm. movie. It is gross. Not even gory, so much it is just disgusting. Yeah. It's very gooey. So. <laughs> so prep your shower. You've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, until next week, we can cross out a rope dope <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, and cross out horror queers with the moo. <laughs> It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm.